Bienvenidas y bienvenidos nuevamente aquí al set de CAF en la COP28 desde Dubai y en esta ocasión nos acompaña Joe Walston. Él es el Executive Vice President for Global Conservation en la WCS, la Wildlife Conservation Society. Joe, nice to have you. It's a pleasure uh, having you here in, at CAF's pavilion in, in, at the COP28. And well, I want to start asking you, how is, uh, what's your impression of how uh, conversations are going on Uh, what, what's your intake of what has happened uh, already here in, at uh, COP28? So thanks very much for having me. It's a mixed bag, I think. Um, on the one hand, um, it's great to see such uh, more participation at this COP than I've seen at previous COPs. We have an incredible array of different peoples from around the world um, represented here and different sectors as well. Um, and it's great to see nature being uh, more heavily represented here than, uh, than previously b before, so that's terrific. On the other hand, there are some major challenges and some also representation of other groups lobbying for business as usual, and we cannot have business as usual. What um, our, our uh, ethos, our uh, slogan in, at CAF, it's we're a region of solutions. Latin America and uh, the Caribbean have uh, has many... Um, many assets that can help fight global warming, that can really contribute uh, to the fight against climate change. What do you think are these uh, uh, specific things that American, Latin American countries and Caribbean countries can contribute to the world uh, struggle? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right, is that, that um, uh, many of the Latin American countries and Caribbean countries um, not only have contributed least to creating the crisis, but they are contributing more to tackling the crisis, and yet they're receiving some of the least for being able to help them so in, in, in being able to tackle that same combined crisis of the loss of nature, climate change, and the persistent breakdown of health as well um, through a broken relationship with nature. So um, out of this, we must not only recognize the values of what the at least Latin American Caribbean communities and governments are, are able to do, but also get behind them and support them in, in much clearer ways than we have done up until now. But there are examples all through the continent uh, that we see at the moment, from coastal fishing communities to indigenous communities to governments themselves that are starting to make the transition to renewable energies, are starting to think of novel forms of land management as well as traditional forms of land and sea management. And that combination must come together of government support, um, the right global incentives um, for that, a transition to, um, to traditional systems of, of recognition of the land and sea tenure, combined with novel forms of economies. And again, we must think about jobs, we must think about economies. But this is all can be aligned around uh, nature, Uh, and how nature ha helps to tackle not only the equity issues, but the climate change issues as well. That's my next question. Um, what are the, the most important links between um, wildlife conservation, uh, ecosystem conservation, and the fight uh, against global warming? How can we uh, fight global warming, conserving uh, These, these beautiful spaces. So we know that nature is, is a key part of the solution. Of course, fundamentally, the world must transition away from fossil fuels into renewable energies, but alongside that must be repairing our relationship with nature. And what that means is um, building back or conserving, as with many areas of Latin America and Caribbean, conserving the high integrity areas, the areas that are already in good shape. That's the most important thing we must do. Why? Because not only are those areas uh, conserving the most important parts of nature, but because they're intact, they're delivering more ecosystem services, they're producing more clean water, they're uh, absorbing more carbon, they're stabilizing local climates as well, they're giving more uh, resources to local communities. But also, because nature is strong in those areas, it's the most resilient to the pressures of climate change. They're going to be able to cope with the pressures of, of the climate change that are inevitably happening now and going to happen for the foreseeable future. So holding on to those areas, whether that be the, um, the coastlines of Patagonia, the Amazon rainforests or some of the island systems of the Caribbean, holding on to those is not only going to be the most important thing for people, but also going to be the best way to tackle climate change and conserve nature and then restore and, and um, restore and reconnect nature. 
And that's that restoration effort has got to be key, helping communities rebuild, retake their lands and seas and to be able to help them um, recover their economies and their, their connections with nature as well. Again, for the two reasons, it will do most for nature and it will do most to help people and communities be resilient in the face of climate change pressures. So um, a lot of the destruction that happens inside these uh, areas comes from pressure from cities, from uh, urban areas. How can we tackle that of, uh, in the point of view of, of the consumer? What the, can the consumers do to help uh, protect these, uh, these natural areas from their point of view? Because I, I see that a lot of people feel uh, pessimistic and feel that it's a too, too big of a task to conserve large areas and they don't have much to do with that. But what's your... So my perspective is actually quite different. I, I'm actually a big fan of urbanization and urban areas. Okay. I think actually um, uh, urban areas do a lot for communities. They do a lot for um, people's uh, rights. They do a lot for women's rights. They, do, they bring down, um, uh, on the whole, cities around the world, bring down uh, child mortality, increase opportunities for education and social recovery. But of course, we look at urban areas and we think they're terrible for the environment. But actually, they are, are, are actually can be quite positive. But of course, There's two things that happen in urban areas. People get detached from nature, so they have no connection with nature, and that's very important. But what I see is models in uh, Central America especially, but also Latin America and the Caribbean, of these fantastic connections that people still have in places like Costa Rica, in Colombia, in uh, even places I've been down into, um, uh, in cities down in um, Patagonia as well. Um, where they have, still have a connection and pride about their country's uh, nature. And then the second one is um, that often um, urban populations can influence policies. They're the ones in these cities, they're the ones most uh, closely connected. So having their constituency of support for nature is crucially important. So I feel that in urban areas um, that we can not only build back um, uh, the connection with nature through what happens in cities, but these are the drivers, these urban middle classes are going to decide the policies and the direction of these countries to make. Are we going to have invest in nature? Are we going to have pro-transition policies uh, away from fossil fuels into renewable energies? Are we going to vote for, advocate for and invest in nature and the people who are protecting nature in the rural areas? And so that's why I think urban areas are so important to invest in. Joe, well, our time is up. It's been a very interesting conversation and I hope uh, you can join us again through all these uh, panels that we have Uh, in, on CAP, uh, at um, CAF's uh, pavilion at COP28. Thank you very much for your time. Y muchas gracias a todos y todas ustedes por seguirnos a través del canal de YouTube de CAF y de la página www.caf.com. Seguimos aquí desde Dubai.